Okay, that's eight o'clock, so I guess we'll begin. Uh, so, uh, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the second the invited talks sessions at uh, this year's DCMI 2021 online. Uh, the session is scheduled from uh, seven o'clock to nine o'clock uh, UTC, so that's up to two hours, and the session is being recorded. So we have um, two talks uh, this morning. I'll just bring up the slide. Where's that come up? Just a moment. And uh, we have two talks this morning from colleagues at uh, Europeana, and which works with thousands of European cultural heritage institutions, giving online access to millions of books, music, artworks, and more. And also from uh, Neil Grindley at JISC, and JISC supports higher education and research in the UK with uh, services including digital infrastructure, networks, and sector-wide uh, procurement deals. Uh, each talk is uh, scheduled to last around um, 20 to 25 minutes uh, and uh, we'll have a Q&A after each talk. Uh, if you would like to uh, ask the panellists any questions, um, please put them in the chat. Uh, this can be uh, to all panellists or to uh, everyone attending. Um, and uh, I'll then um, ask those questions, uh, put them to the panellists uh, afterwards. Um, so, our first talk is from Antoine Isaac and Monica Marrero. Uh, since completing his PhD studies at Paris Sorbonne and the Institut National de l'Audiovisuel, Antoine has researched and promoted the use of semantic web and linked data technologies in culture. Uh, his work has focused on the representation and interoperability of collections and their vocabularies, and he served on a, a number of uh, W3C initiatives, including SCOS and data on web best practices. Uh, Monica Marrero is the search specialist at Europeana uh, with degrees in both computer science and library science. Uh, she combined these in her PhD, which focused on information extraction. Uh, her areas of interest include the ap application of natural language processing, semantic technologies and machine translation are currently focused on the area of the digital library. Um, she's contributed to uh, many top conferences and journals in the field as both an author and a reviewer. Uh, so I'll now stop sharing and uh, hand you over to Antoine Monica. Thank you very much, Alasir, for the, uh, the introduction. Uh, it is a pleasure for, for us to be, uh, to be here today, uh, Monica and myself. Uh, so uh, we do work for the Europeana Foundation, the organization that, uh, that offers uh, the, the Europeana.eu service. Uh, and I, I, will, uh, I will tell uh, more about, uh, about this, uh, of course, uh, in the coming, uh, the, coming, uh, the coming slides. So today uh, we want uh, to, uh, to give you an update uh, on the work that Europeana does to address, uh, to address the, more, the many multiple challenges it has, uh, it has to face. Uh, uh, we have uh, called uh, entitled this uh, this presentation an update uh, because actually it, it does follow on uh, some uh, earlier presentations in the in past uh, DCMI conferences uh, where Europeana has presented the work that we we do uh, with uh, with the semantic web with with knowledge graphs uh, so in a way uh, this uh, this presentation is is a continuation of uh, of a longer series of uh, uh, of presentations and involvements that we uh, that we had uh, with the uh, the wonderful Dublin Core conference. So Europeana.eu, 
so this is an initiative from the European Union. Uh, and uh, what is very relevant here uh, for this talk is that uh, it, it means that uh, Europeana has to serve uh, all the countries in the, uh, the European Union. So uh, we are not country specific. Uh, Europeana publishes currently 52 uh, million digitized objects. Uh, and uh, that is based on metadata from 4,000 libraries, archives, and museums uh, in over 44 countries. Uh, so on, uh, on the left, uh, you can see the, uh, the homepage of, of Europeana uh, with uh, some invitation to search and browse through cultural heritage that is uh, digitized in, uh, in Europe and a bit, uh, a bit elsewhere. Uh, but below that, there is uh, on the bottom right, this uh, vast network uh, of, uh, of institutions that do send metadata. And this is how we make the digitalized cultural heritage available, by providing links to it uh, and providing a search service on top of the metadata. And that, that's important also for the remainder of the, of the talk. Uh, so the European website uh, aims to provide a multilingual experience uh, to its users. And uh, we have identified in a previous work uh, on, on uh, making a multilingual strategy for Europeana four main use cases for, uh, for multilingual experience. So the first one is to navigate the Europeana website. So that's uh, basically about uh, giving the user the means uh, to click and to read labels uh, in, uh, in a way that is meaningful for, for them. The second use case is read editorial content, uh, which is about uh, accessing all the editorial content, all the text, the virtual exhibitions, uh, the blog posts uh, that are published either by the European Foundation or by our partners via the, via the website. Uh, the third one is uh, to read the item text, uh, which, uh, by, uh, which uh, actually means that uh, for a given piece of digitized cultural heritage, a certain object, uh, then uh, we present information and that information should be made available uh, in the languages that, uh, that we want to, uh, to serve. Uh, and finally, uh, Search Europeana. So Europeana uh, acts uh, as an access service that is fueled by a search engine. So that, that showed in the, in the screenshot here on the, the right of this slide. Uh, users can enter their queries and they will get uh, they will get results. And of course, uh, the multilingual environment that we are in uh, raises quite a number of challenges. So uh, uh, we have to work quite hard on this. Uh, and uh, as the bold font indicates uh, on this slide, this is going to be uh, the main focus of the talk today. So I'm going to touch on what we do for the other use cases. Uh, and that's going to serve as a sort of long introduction uh, to the main matter of the talk, which will be uh, our work on search. Uh, so coming back to the, the four use cases and what uh, the general uh, strategy is. Uh, so uh, the idea is that first users land on a language specific version of the European portal. Uh, the first use case navigate the website for this, uh, we do uh, turn to either automatic paid or volunteer translation of Europeana UI elements to the user language. Uh, the second use case, read editorial content. Uh, for this, we rely on either paid or volunteer, volunteer static translation to user languages. Uh, for the search case, uh, in a nutshell, and Monica is going to tell uh, a lot more about it, uh, we actually uh, rely on expanding the query in the original user language with a query in English uh, using live machine translation. Uh, and that is uh, also supported by uh, an augmented version of our multilingual database, which is what, uh, what is visible here on the right, uh, where we take the original metadata we receive from providers and then we exploit first uh, multilingual vocabularies that are either coming from providers or from Europeana. And this is uh, something that we are not going to tell much about because actually that's been presented uh, in, the, in the past uh, DCMI conferences. Uh, the novelty here for multilingual strategies that we envision uh, using English as a pivot language for translation. So next to the multilingual vocabularies, uh, we will translate 
uh, the, the metadata to English so that it can be used by this multilingual query mechanism, well, bilingual query mechanism to be, to be more precise. The fourth case, uh, which is reading the, uh, the item text, uh, basically expects that we can uh, give to the user some language specific version of the page for every item. Uh, and that again uh, is going to rely on live machine translation uh, from English uh, to, uh, to the user language. And again, that's gonna use the English version, which is uh, made accessible in our multilingual uh, metadata base. So that is the general picture that we, uh, we have uh, and that, that is guiding us for multilingual efforts. Uh, giving a bit more detail uh, for the website UI translation, basically it looks like uh, these uh, three uh, snapshots I've taken of the top bar uh, of the Europeana website, first in English, then in uh, French and in, in Spanish. Uh, so we do cover uh, the translation of the UI elements for all the 24 official uh, EU languages plus Basque. Uh, the, the problems here is that we have to release new UI features uh, very often, and that, that needs to be translated, that needs to be updated. And professional or volunteer translation requires a lot of time or money or motivation. So we ended up uh, trying to go for a mixed approach where we use automatic translation to save uh, time and money. And when in doubt, uh, and that, that corresponds to actually when they are uh, um, let's say ambiguous translation results, then we validate the translation with native speaker. We also do have some, uh, some input from partners uh, who do submit translation, uh, either via the feedback button on the website or by email. Uh, as regards the translation of the editorial content, uh, we are mostly relying on asking volunteers to translate virtual exhibitions, etc. So European has a vast network of cultural heritage partners, uh, projects or institutions uh, that are uh, quite interested to serve uh, the users in their own country. So uh, when they uh, they contribute a virtual exhibition, for example, to us, they uh, very often also uh, are interested in having one or several translations. Uh, and uh, in the past months, we, we've, uh, we've seen that the exhibitions published in more than one language increased from 50% to 64%, which Number-wise does not seem a lot, but actually does represent a lot of input from our partners here. Regarding the third case, the, the translation of the item page. Uh, so uh, our goal here is to enable the users of the European website uh, to apply on the fly translation so that the description, uh, the metadata for items can be uh, shown in their language of choice. So we do provide this for all 24 official EU languages. Uh, and for the moment, we, uh, we have tried to use the uh, real-time translation service for, for Google. And it does uh, look like this. Uh, so uh, here we have uh, a music instrument uh, with a German description. Uh, and there is a bit, uh, there is a small invitation at the top uh, for the user to translate this item page uh, in a language of choice. Uh, and uh, when clicking on, on Spanish, so that triggers a live translation uh, of, of the description to, to Spanish uh, with, uh, with a little cue uh, behind uh, every metadata label that indicates uh, that uh, this comes from, from automatic translation as a warning from the user to tell them that this is not the original, uh, the trusted metadata that uh, that we get, but something which which may be a bit less reliable because, of course, everyone knows that automatic translation is not uh, is not always uh, perfect, especially in our domain. So the users, uh, well, Europeana shall be transparent to to its users when when it comes to applying that sort of technology. Uh, as uh, for the four use case, the the search, uh, so. What we have done so far is not to try to, to tackle uh, all the problems related to search because uh, there are quite so many components that are required as per our multilingual strategy. Uh, rather, we have first uh, focused on a, on a, a limited pilot, uh, which, uh, which has been dedicated to search in Spanish. Uh, so uh, we wanted to test this idea of, of the strategy to translate the search queries. 
uh, and to, to validate that for only one language. And that allows us to put aside uh, a lot of issues that are raised by multilinguality regarding the entire process. For, for example, the multilingual strategy and visions that uh, the metadata shall be translated to English as, as pivot language. Uh, actually, this is something that we have not uh, tried yet in, uh, in our Spanish search pilot. So that enables us to focus on some components and get something visible for, uh, for users and uh, for these components much earlier. I will not do a live demo, uh, but rather rely on, uh, on a couple of uh, screenshots to, uh, to show you uh, uh, the, 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 well, the consequences of, of these pilots in, uh, in action. Uh, so when, when searching for epidemias in, uh, in Spanish, for example, uh, so on the basic uh, portal, which is on the left, uh, you can see that there is only one result coming from the UK collections. Uh, and uh, when uh, in the Spanish search pilot, uh, which is on the right, uh, then that, uh, the, that number of items uh, of results coming from the UK has quite drastically augmented uh, position in UK now as the, the second source of, of results. Uh, and uh, well, that, that shows that uh, uh, there is a possibility to, uh, to apply the technology and, and get uh, more things. Uh, now, of course, uh, the question is uh, whether those things are interesting for the users, uh, and uh, that's going to be uh, what uh, my colleague Monica is, is going to present uh, right now, uh, at the same time as giving more details on the, the technicalities. So, Monica, now uh, the floor is yours, and I'm going to uh, switch slides for you. So, Thanks, Antoine. Um, yeah, I will... The previous one? Yeah, thank you. Um, so I will continue talking about the Spanish search pilot, as Antoine mentioned. And in this part of the presentation, I will give uh, more details about the implementation of the pilot, but especially about the uh, evaluation we conducted and the, first, uh, and the results we obtained for the main task we have uh, in the search, in the mobility search, which, which are the identification of the language of the query, the translation of the query to English, and the construction of the multilingual query and then the search, in this case, on the metadata collection. Next, please. So this is uh, the previous one, Antoine, please. Evaluation, yes. Um, so this is the setup we have for the evaluation. And uh, in this case, we took a sample of 300 queries from the European and Spanish portal and we used as collection and snapshot of the metadata collection, which contains uh, more than 62 million documents. And around 17% of them are in English and 5% in Spanish, provided uh, originally in those languages. So we manually annotated the results obtained when we apply uh, those um, main tasks, identification of the language, translation of the query, and then the search with the multilingual query um, to the sample. Next, please. So let's go already with the first task, which is the real-time notification of the language of the query. For the implementation, we use uh, the service provided by Google. In this case, it's called uh, the Google Cloud Translation API. And we use exactly the same service for the evaluation. And we manually annotated uh, the language of the query and the results obtained from this, uh, from this service. So we focus the evaluation on three main query questions. Uh, the first one, can we assume that the language of the query is Spanish when we are using the Spanish portal? This is because, of course, this is one of the options we have, but also because we have already tested this uh, before and we wanted to confirm the results obtained. The second one is what is the effectiveness of the language identification service provided by Google? And finally, what is the impact on translation of choosing one option or the other? Next, please. So these are the results for the uh, three questions. And um, as you can see, if we assume that the language of the, of the query is Spanish, then we will have 21% of error, according to the evaluation on the sample. Uh, this error, uh, this amount of error is reduced to only 4% if we use the service provided by Google. 
Surprisingly, um, the impact of translation of choosing one option or the other is not uh, is not high. Actually, it's very low. It's less than one percentage point. However, an accuracy, a good uh, accuracy in this task in identification of the, the language of the query is is, um, is useful not only for the translation in this case, but also for other tasks we have in the multilingual flow. So, for example, for display. Next, please. Let's go with the second task, in this case, the real-time translation of the query once we have identified the source language. And uh, for the implementation, we use, again, Google, the service provided by Google for the translation. And for the evaluation, we compare this service with e-translation service, which is the one provided by the European Commission. Next, please. So these are the results obtained, and we can see clearly that uh, Google is more effective than the translation. In this case, it's 20% more effective for the translation of the query. Next, please. So let's go uh, finally to the construction, to the third task, the construction of a multilingual query and then the search. For the implementation, we choose uh, and the construction of the multilingual uh, query, we use a very simple approach. In this case, we just connected the original query and the translation in English of the query using the logical operator OR. You can see an example here. And then uh, for the evaluation, we compare the results uh, obtained um, when we use the original query and when we use the multilingual query using, of course, the metadata collection, the snapshot uh, I commented before. And we focus the evaluation in this case, in these questions we have here. So the first one, what is the difference in the number of the results? Uh, this, of course, a base for the potential increase in recall. Uh, do we have more documents in English in the top 10 positions when we use the multilingual query? What is the difference in precision at 10? So um, are we losing relevant documents in the top 10 results or not? And what is the effect of having typos, ambiguity, and non-translatable entities in the queries in precision at 10? So let's go and see the first uh, well, the results obtained for the three um, first questions. And as you can see, um, with the multilingual query, as expected, we obtain more results in total. But we also obtain more English documents in the top 10 positions. And of course, this, is, uh, this comes with a cost. And the cost in this case is um, a losing precision, but we only lose, uh, on average, one document that is relevant in the top 10 for one query out of four. So the balance is uh, not bad in this case. In any case, um, we have to increase precision. So this is why uh, we run some tests to analyze what are the factors that could be contributing to a negative effect on the difference in precision. Next, please. One of these uh, factors is uh, the existence of typos in the quest. So uh, we analyzed the effect of, uh, of typos, of the queries with typos, and we found out that uh, actually this effect is the effect in the precision at 10 is not significant. So we cannot conclude anything about the typos. It could also be that we don't have enough power to run this test because we only have 5% of queries with uh, typos, which is expected. Next, please. Um, we also analyze the effect of ambiguity. In this case, we consider that a query is ambiguous when it can have different translations depending on the intention of the user. So, for example, Granada could be a Spanish city, but it could also be a fruit. We have 9% of queries in the sample which are uh, ambiguous. And we found out that uh, we have a significant effect in precision at 10. Uh, these queries decrease from the relevance of the top 10 results, as you can see in the, in the chart. Next, please. And finally, we also analyze the effect of entities. In this case, uh, we are referring 
only to those entities that should not be translated. So, for example, Juan Gris cannot be translated as John Gray, and Antonio Sordi cannot be translated as Antonio Dev, which is something I've seen before. We have many queries with this uh, type of entities, only in the sample we have more than half with them. And we discover that uh, these queries mainly decrease or maintain the relevance of the top 10 results and the effect is significant. We also analyze the effect on the quality of translation and we observe that most of Google grown translations come from queries that contain this type of entities. Next, please. <clears throat> so to summarize um, the work we did on the, on the Spanish pilot and the results obtained, we, as you can see, uh, we obtained promising results. Uh, the balance uh, between uh, the, the number of results we get, uh, the, number of, uh, the, the number of documents in other languages and the loose on precision is, is promising. Uh, we uh, observe that Google is more effective than assuming the language of the portal, in this case, uh, Spanish. We Google is more effective than in translation, the translation of the queries. And uh, even though the balance, as I said, is good, uh, we, uh, yeah, we know that we have to deal uh, with uh, two main issues, in this case, ambiguity and the existence of entities that shouldn't be translated. So for the first one, for ambiguity, uh, as Antoine commented before, transparency is important for the item page, but also it should be for the search. Uh, so the users should be aware of what is going on there. And we are also um, planning to, to include more options to the user to limit the results to specific fields or topics so we can um, narrow the query. Then for the entities, we plan to use control vocabularies for the identification and the translation of the query of the entities we have in the queries. And this is actually already included in the multilingual strategy. And finally, um, following an approach like this, uh, we have to, to apply any, um, any method we can to increase precision in general. So uh, one of them, would be a uh, routine multilingual query to fields in a specific uh, languages. So try to make the multilingual query more specific to the languages. So we reduce noise coming from, from the mixing of languages. And of course, we have to improve the enrichment because the noise that we can get from there uh, could affect especially uh, the English, uh, the documents in English. So this is um, all from me, uh, and I will give back the floor now to Antoine so he can conclude the, the presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Monica. Uh, so uh, yeah, what I'm going to do now is to try to, to come back uh, and uh, reposition the, the specific search effort that, that Monica has presented into the, uh, the, the wider uh, multilingual strategy. So again, with uh, with our four use cases. So uh, this uh, this work allows us to well, to claim that we we are making quite good progress against uh, the four use cases. Uh, so with respect to navigation, uh, users can generally benefit from translation of UI in their own language. Uh, this always requires adaptation, uh, of course. Uh, with respect to uh, editorial content, uh, as said, the users have access to more and more editorials in their own language. Uh, that is not complete, uh, but we uh, we hope to uh, to increase the coverage uh, uh, as the best practice of of providing content in more than one language uh, is is followed. Regarding the read item text, uh, so uh, there is this uh, on the fly metadata translation. Uh, that I presented uh, before Monica's part. Uh, that is scheduled uh, to be deployed uh, this month, uh, so at the end of this month, because uh, we are fairly well into the month now. Uh, and, uh, and we will, uh, we will see uh, how it works with, uh, with our users. And regarding the, the search, 
Uh, so with the, the, the search uh, pilot for the Spanish portal that Monica has presented, uh, a user searching for, for, uh, for the, the Spanish, well, into the Spanish version of your piano will obtain more results uh, described in English next to the Spanish one. So this is uh, a partial coverage with respect to the multi world strategy, but still uh, this is progress. And uh, we are envisioning to, uh, to release this uh, for the Spanish version of the European portal uh, in, this, uh, in this quarter, so before the, uh, the end of the, of the year. Oops. Uh, the coming work. Uh, so as, as already mentioned, actually uh, a lot of the work uh, on these four use cases is, uh, is bound to be always ongoing. Uh, so there will be always new UI features, new exhibitions. Uh, so uh, those, th those things will, will not uh, stop. Uh, regarding the, let's say, the technologically harder uh, cases, uh, the, the translation of the item page and uh, the multilingual search, uh, we plan to do uh, more tests and evaluations. So further test the item page and the Spanish search with users that are going to be deployed in the coming, uh, the coming month. Uh, and later, we would like to, uh, to try to do some tests with uh, other portals and uh, other languages. Uh, and meanwhile, uh, we will continue to work on the underlying data. Uh, so uh, in, uh, in the first slides, I, I've mentioned that we still work on augmenting our database with multilingual vocabularies uh, and, uh, and of course the, uh, the pivot translation to, to English. Uh, and we need to implement indicators uh, for measuring the impact on the actions on making the underlying data more multilingual. Uh, uh, as regards, uh, more specific actions, we, we're also going to work on normalizing the language information. So we get some language information, but sometimes it's uh, in a bit exotic uh, shape. And, and of course, people uh, at the DCMI conference will be aware of the importance of metadata normalization. Uh, we also want uh, to, uh, to do more language detection. A lot of the metadata we receive actually is not marked as coming in a certain language. Uh, and uh, that prevents us from applying uh, multilingual technology uh, with good levels of precision. Uh, and finally, uh, the multilingual strategy heavily relies on translation of metadata to English. Uh, and uh, a project has recently started uh, called Europeana Translate uh, that is going to, uh, to work on this, uh, this static translation and the augmentation of our, uh, of our database. Uh, that is going to apply uh, automatic translation uh, and also uh, doing this while customizing existing machine translation engines to the cultural heritage domain. So in the coming months, we are going to see whether we can find some aligned cochra in uh, different languages so that we can train translation engines. And of course, if anyone uh, here or in the future would have some aligned cochra for the cultural heritage domain uh, to contribute to the project, that would be extremely welcome because, of course, uh, the technology cannot uh, solve much if it is not instructed with uh, good examples. So that's, uh, that was it for our talk. So thanks uh, again for, for listening. And uh, if you've got uh, any question, then feel free to ask them now or uh, later by contacting, uh, contacting us via Europeana. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you very much, Anton. Um, are you okay to stop sharing now? Great, so that's us back. Um, well, if anyone has any questions for Monica or for Antoine, uh, please do uh, put them now uh, in, the, uh, in the chat. And thank you both for a really excellent and very interesting presentation. Um, I do actually have uh, a couple of questions to start off with. Uh, the first one's for Monica, which was um, looking at the uh, the question of uh, things like um, names of um, of persons uh, being translated, or other cases where you may have more than one uh, way that a word could be translated. Was there any difference in the way the searches were constructed? Uh, so, for example, if um, the searches were constructed using an advanced search facility where you would put names of creator, creator or um, uh, contributor entities in uh, as against putting uh, just a, a string of keywords into a single 
unified search box. Thanks, Anastasia. It's, it's a very interesting question because um, actually this is one of the things we we are also planning to propose to do um, in, in promote the advanced search in order uh, that in order to allow the users to identify exactly what they want to search for. This is already available in European, but actually the most uh, use, the most used um, functionality in this case is the general search. We have the search box and users write there what they want to look for. It could be a, a title, it could be an author, it could be a concept. So we have tested with that because we know that it's the main uh, functionality and we have to be prepared for that. Of course, the results are expected to be better if we can uh, uh, reduce or limit the, the results to only some fields. So that's why we started to evaluate with the whole uh, thing, let's say, and then we will, uh, we will see how it, it behaves with uh, the advanced search, let's say. And um, when you're introducing controlled vocabularies for, um, for the entities, would they then potentially map from the advanced search to specific areas of the controlled vocabularies? And um, what would you do? Would you try and import, uh, say, the authority catalogues of all the major European countries so that you would have things to map to? Um... Uh, actually, right now we don't do that. We have an auto autocomplete functionality, so you can select the entities, but they they are uh, going to to be uh, used in the in the general search box I, I commented before. Uh, but actually, one of the um, improvements we have been uh, yeah we have been discussing um, in the Europeana is uh, the possibility to add not only yeah, the entity, but also the type of entity. So that could lead to what exactly what you are saying. Yeah, if, if this entity is an author, then maybe you can look for it uh, in the author uh, field. It's not so clear because it could be an author, but it could be also um, art or art that is related to that author. But it could help in this uh, decision, or at least we can we can help the user to identify where it's better to look for it. And, uh, and if, oh, sorry, <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. If 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 I if I may ask uh, add uh, something because uh, because Alastair they raised the, the the interesting point of uh, of handling existing authority files, uh, and that's that's going to come back to uh, to some of the earlier presentations that we we gave at DCMI. So we have this this idea of building. Uh, an entity collection for Europeana, basically a sort of Europeana knowledge graph. Uh, and that, uh, that is not directly composed of the, uh, the authority uh, files that, uh, that are used by our providers because we, we cannot handle the diversity of, of them. Uh, but we try to, uh, to use sources uh, like Wikidata, which actually would be connected uh, to some of these author authorities. Uh, and on the input side in the metadata, uh, we allow, oh well, uh, we we try to allow the providers to use as much authorities as possible. So we hope that there would be a connection between the original metadata using original authorities, so to say, and our knowledge graph using Wikidata and some others, which would connect uh, by co-reference links, so the sort of same as links uh, that exist in those databases, uh, so that we can make a connection with the, the sort of auto-suggest uh, that Monica mentioned between. Uh, a, a sort of general catch-all knowledge graph and the authorities used in the original metadata, hopefully providing more precision. And are the providers of the original metadata also um, at, at any points providing uh, permanent identifiers along with uh, text for the, uh, for the entities at the moment? Well, we hope that their linked data identifiers are as persistent uh, as possible. Actually, we don't really pay so much uh, attention to the fact that they use a formal persistent uh, system uh, like DOI or something like that, as long as it's an identifier that works uh, through time. So, I mean, we are more interested in the practical effect of persistence rather than the uh, the formal uh, enforcement mechanism around it. So any HTTP or HTTPS links that 
that is guaranteed to uh, to last long because the institution is committed to it. That's interesting for us. Okay. And uh, Neil, you've uh, posted a question in the chat as well. Yeah, thanks. It's really interesting, uh, Antoine, Monica. Thank you. Um, I hadn't really properly considered the complexity of handling multilingual data <laughs> in this way before. I mean, how many people, how many staff work on this issue within the Europeana team? Or is it, very, is it threaded I, through the, all of your activities, perhaps? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm going to take that one because that relates to the more general strategy and all the different uh, use cases actually require contributions uh, from people in different teams. So, uh, of course, there's the, the more uh, technical side uh, that is uh, embodied by, uh, by Monica uh, today, uh, but there are also some people working on the, uh, on the, on the, on the database. Uh, then people uh, working for the acquisition of data in our uh, in our uh, data ingestion team uh, for all uh, the design. Uh, of course, uh, people work hard on well figuring out what kind of design uh, would be useful, and then the portal team has to handle uh, those designs, but also the connection with the uh, well the specific services like the search one that Monica is working on plus. Uh, all the system to translate uh, the labels in the UI uh, plus the editorial text. So uh, we've got some kind of a multilingual content management system uh, there. I mean, I'm, I'm simply simplifying a lot. Uh, and then, uh, of course, at uh, I'm going to say a, a softer level, uh, then there, there are all our, our colleagues uh, working on making the, uh, the virtual exhibitions and other pieces of editorial content uh, who are uh, also encouraging all our network uh, to to provide translation of the the longer and, and more curated text. So that that's that's really a lot. Uh, it's very hard to quantify because in European, uh, almost everyone does a bit of this, a bit of that. Uh, but I would say uh, probably a a quarter up to half uh, of our workforce have something to do with uh, one multilingual aspect or another in, in some capacity. So, and that's, uh, I mean, absolute terms, so that would be two dozens of, of persons, maybe. Thanks, Antoine. And uh, Tom, you. you've also got a question. Um, it's around the role of volunteers. Yes, it, it, it's just uh, following up and uh, uh, Antoine, you already touched on this in your um, uh, a bit in your last response, but i um, curious about the uh, overall uh, role of, of volunteers uh, in uh, curating the uh, or helping with translations and um, how that is um, facilitated with the um, with the platform. So the yeah so the, the that's that's uh, that's a good question and indeed I've, I've touched a bit on it uh, but the the, plat the platform uh, does provide uh, the technical means uh, to translate uh, I mean for volunteers to contribute to translation mostly of the UI and the uh, the editorial content uh, and then there's uh, there's all the ecosystem around with uh, with our colleagues who uh, who have to. Uh, uh, to encourage people to do that. Actually, a lot of uh, those volunteers, I mean, maybe I should use volunteer with quotes, uh, they are also coming from, from projects who have actually a vested interest uh, in contributing uh, translation. So making sure that, uh, that Europeana works well also for, for their audience. So they are not in the Europeana staff, uh, but they are in, uh, in our ecosystem. And, uh, and sometimes they uh, they they are they are paid, but that that's coming from sort of different uh, the different uh, formal sources of uh, of funding. Uh, but they they will play a key role in uh, in sourcing the, the translation, doing them themselves. Uh, so channeling feedback of various sorts into uh, into the core platform. That's something I was going to ask actually, which was how you uh, did recruit the volunteers. So they, they often come uh, through the organizations that are perhaps putting on um, exhibitions or sending content to you. Yeah, 
yeah, so we've got a lot of thematic projects. Uh, for example, I mean, for I mean, we have well, one recent example would be a project uh, or working on the some some exhibitions related to the the, the 20th century, uh, and um, they they've done a lot in trying to source things that are uh, uh, that are translated. Uh, there we've been also in touch uh, with uh, the European Parliament archive. Uh, and uh, they said, okay, we we would like to to do a virtual exhibition with Europeana, and we are going to, uh, to translate everything into twenty four languages. So there, there's also a bit of uh, of flexibility here. I mean, it's hard to come with a, a general answer to the question because uh, some some partners, some volunteers are way uh, more resourced than other ones to tackle multilingual issues. Uh, so we have uh, one more question from Marcia in the chat. Uh, so Marcia, would you like to uh, put that question and then we'll move on to Neil's talk after that. Hi, yes, I am sure there are lots of uh, strategies you already have. I was just wondering if we think two different levels, one is just a language you tell, what is that language? And also the meaning, uh, what is the meaning of that? So I saw the Google translator, there were, you, if you heard about the, the keynote for the sample model, the portal provides multiple languages automatically. So when people browse, instead of Finnish, you can browse by English, browse by Chinese. And that was early time I was talking with them. I said, how will you have a better one? For example, when the Finnish is about the the position of chair, people chair or lead a team, lead a troop, become English, um, become chair. And then I saw the Chinese become the chair you lead, you <laughs> in the furniture. So I, I said, I become and <laughs> Tom knows that. So uh, I said, how will you um, be able to enhance um, some obviously conflict things. So that's one, that's one uh, immediately question I had when I saw your effort. Uh, because Google Trans, how to collaborate or enhance the Google Translate based on your experience. That will be very helpful to, to uh, let a user also say, oh, I mean this, and you mean that <laughs> somehow. And I know that search engine using the synonym rings to accumulate the different terms referring to the same thing. That's another, uh, just that's the two ideas when you talk about that. <laughs> yeah. Monica, do you want to answer or should I try? Yes, okay, go. Yeah, thanks, Marcia. Um, uh, yeah, it's actually, I think it's one of the hardest thing we have to solve because uh, we have um, the sources of ambiguity here are very diverse. So we have ambiguity um, because we have different languages we, we are translating. So maybe what we have, uh, yeah, we have, different concepts in one language, it could be that you know, in, in English, it's not like that. So Granada, if you translate uh, directly grenade, then probably that's also only a fruit. It's not going to be the Spanish city. So you have already um, decided. Then we have another source of uh, ambiguity, which I didn't, I didn't talk about because uh, we didn't have the time, but it's because you remove the context. So for example, you are looking for civil war and then uh, you do that in Spanish and that you are going to get probably documents talking about civil war in Spain. But if you translate it 
then the context is gone. So then um, probably you are not going to get what you were expecting from uh, from the Spanish portal, from the language you are using. So, and then uh, what you said, if you if you are looking for chair, what what do you mean by that? Is chair is the is the chair the furniture or is the is the the person who is chairing some or something? So, in general, for the first um, problem, so the, the difference in the translation, we think we haven't. I have to say that uh, we haven't. Um, get to this yet. I mean, we are in the in the stage of analyzing the information and then see what we are going to do next. So we have to to go deep in these uh, details. But for the first problem, we think transparency is the best um, solution because as you said, Marcia, the user could, if, if the user see, yeah, this is translated wrongly, he could uh, remove the translation or he could even edit, edit it. Then for the for the context, one of the options we can we have we can apply is um, using popularity. So at the end, of, for example, chair. Um, depending where you are looking for and in our database, probably you are going to go to chair as a furniture because we have um, many of that. So in our case, popularity will also solve that problem. It's something that it's not specific for multilinguality. It's also a, a solution for the monolingual system. But in this case, for multilinguality, I think it will work uh, pretty well. It's the same in the same line that uh, allowing the user to filter by fields is not something that is specific uh, for a multilingual system. In a monolingual system, it will work uh, well. It will improve the results. But when you have more results and they could be ambiguous, it's even more important. And then um, the synonym rings is an interesting uh, concept. We haven't implemented them. We, we don't have them. Uh, but it's something we should uh, consider. So um, yeah, I don't know if I have answered your question. Marcia? Yeah. Thank you so much. I know this is endless issues. So. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. But the, wonderful that you have this idea and then so uh, important. Right. Yeah. I have the colleagues have, you know, in the hospitals, you also need to have this. When, especially when the people or in emergency and couldn't speak themselves. Only the family maybe did not speak, learned English at all. So when they came, the hospital always have to tell what language first, what exactly, yeah. and which, which Spanish, and then in order to get the help from automatic translation. Yeah. So you you're doing wonderful pioneer work. Thank Great. you. Very good. Okay. Well, thank you, Monica and Antoine. Um, that was really really enjoyable talk. Really enjoyed it. And um, we'll now move on uh, to our. Second presenter today. And uh, this is from Neil Grindley. And Neil is um, Director of Content and Discovery Services at JISC. Uh, and he has a strategic responsibility for developing products and maintaining services that enable universities and colleges to acquire, create, manage, find and access resources for teaching, learning and research. And Neil has managed uh, and led national initiatives focused on the digital humanities, digital preservation and data infrastructure for libraries. 
And uh, Neil's looking at two major initiatives in the uh, United Kingdom that are ongoing at the moment. So uh, Neil, I'll hand over to you. Right. <clears throat> thank you ever so much, Alistair. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for inviting me to come and talk to DCMI, which I've never um, attended before, all the years it's been on. Um, <clears throat> just to say you know, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to uh, whenever people uh, uh, catch up with this or uh, and, <clears throat> and, and a shout out to, to uh, um, uh, the, uh, those who are joining in the middle of the night, um, Marcia in particular, <laughs> I think it's about 4am where you are. Um, <clears throat> so this is, this is going to be a little bit different. Um, Many thanks to Antoine and Monica. A really interesting talk about multilingual issues and, and, and translation. Uh, I suppose what underpins what I'm going to be talking about really is, uh, to some extent, kind of data rights and uh, metadata kind of restrictions on um, the kind of sharing and the flow of data. This is this is really what drives um, certainly the, the the Plan M thinking. Um, but let me just uh, first of all uh, talk you through a little bit about um, the context of what I'm going to be talking about in terms of the national bibliographic knowledge base. Uh, as Alistair says, this is this is focused on the UK and and perhaps to to some large extent some of the issues around data flow and data openness and data reuse uh, are perhaps um, more relevant to a UK context. Uh, realizing this is an, an international conference, but um, hopefully this will still be of interest. Um, perhaps it will resonate in, in different ways to different uh, national contexts. So the NBK, uh, as, as we call it for short, um, essentially what is it? Well, it's um, you know, we take in uh, library data, library catalog data, just as, as Alistair said, is a, a provides services, um, digital services and digital products to uh, UK universities and colleges mainly, but uh, others as well. But uh, we take that uh, library data in, uh, we put it into a, a data lake, and then we layer services on top of that, uh, that uh, very big aggregation of data that's uh, at the moment we uh, are receiving data from 176 different institutions, including national libraries and the, and the biggest uh, research university libraries uh, in the UK. That all uh, aggregates, uh, there's about 130 million records we're bringing in. We apply and deduplication down on, on the right hand kind of flow. Uh, we deduplicate those records down to about 48 million consolidated records. and. Uh, we make those available in um, the Library Hub Discover service, which is our main discovery, our, 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 the way that in one place one can have, interrogate the holdings of UK libraries. We also use that data in our compare service, which uh, libraries can use to um, map kind of collection overlap across libraries. Um, and on the other on the other sort of side of this um, data flow, we push the data out in, in another instance in an undeduplicated database that we use for uh, enabling people to download catalog records from our Library Hub cataloging service. Um, and so some of these areas in this diagram are, are more problematic than others, uh, or, or at least are more relevant for what I'm talking about. And it's really this left hand side and this piece around data coming in, some of which is is got like is licensed data, it's got it's got um uh sort of uh data rights associated with it uh, from the origin from where it comes from. And I'm also going to be talking about um how we're working with uh, OCLC and we want to uh, push data out through WorldCat. Libraries are very keen on uh the data being available within JISC systems but also being highly visible. Uh, globally through uh, WorldCat as well. So we're talking about the uh, uh, the agreements and the national agreement that we've been, um, what, you know, we want to get into, and we're on the, we're on the verge of uh, really launching with OCLC. So um, there's other bits of this diagram, but uh, I'll, basically the grayed out bits are, are, are components that we're working on, and these, these these notes up here about OA resources and publisher data is is 
other sources of data that we want to bring into the MBK aggregation um, when we can. We're doing a bit of that now, but we want to do more of that, and that's in the roadmap. Right, so this is a complicated diagram, and it's uh, it's not really uh, uh, strangely meant to be uh, instantly understandable. Um, you know, the point really it's making is, is how complex the uh, the, the data, either ecosystem or marketplace, as, as I uh, alternately refer to it in the UK, actually is. Um, uh, the, the, the kind of plumbing diagram, if you like, was, was designed for us by uh, some consultants who we asked to try and visualise how data does or doesn't flow uh, around the various entities in the UK that deal with bibliographic data or manage it or, or create it or manage it or or make it available um, as you can see there's uh, there are various different entities and various different ways that uh, data kind of flows through into into library systems uh, there's libraries over here uh, and it through into discovery systems and sometimes I call it an ecosystem because in some cases the data kind of goes around and, and gets passed uh, from one entity, set of entities to another uh, uh, in, in terms of kind of a, a mutually beneficial exchange. In other instances, there is, a, there is a transactional element to the data flow and money changes hands and therefore rights is also associated. Uh, with creation of data and it's pass, passing on through the supply chain. It's, we've been talking about this in the UK for some years. Uh, I started in, in, in uh, looking at these uh, set of issues uh, around about 2014, 2015, and it's taken uh, all this time to get to the point where uh, we uh, are, are working on this more kind of programmatic um, effort to try and untangle this data and to basically take, make the data more open, uh, as open as possible, and uh, to get it flowing. Um, this is a set of statements um, that were put forward by um, some librarian colleagues uh, at this at this meeting we had in in London back in 2019, <clears throat> give you a sort of a, give you a kind of flavour of uh, the um, uh, you know the the kind of context with which we're, we're working to try and open up this data. Uh, these these statements, particularly these the first three there, I want to be able to share the work that I do. I want to use the work that other librarians do. I want to be able to enrich and share metadata, and that's that's very much specifically referring to you know, cataloging teams within libraries. Um, what's what's happening uh, quite quite often is that um, data is being uh, acquired along with the, the materials that libraries are um, bringing into the library, uh, and that data. Is is not fit for purpose, um, and particularly the the ebook metadata uh, that gets supplied uh, can be very variable, and so uh, there are teams within libraries in the UK who are customising or or looking at that data and, and enhancing that data to make it uh, fit for purpose in terms of uh, their use uh, their, their use cases that individual libraries have. Um, and it seems it, it is uh, inefficient for for one team to be uh, enhancing and uh, and uh, adding to to that data and then not being able to share it with with other libraries who may have similar requirements uh, in terms of the you know, there's, there's clusters of requirements with libraries who have who have similar uh, I mean, use cases for their data um, and it would make sense if JISC acting as a uh, a neutral broker and a, and a, and, a um, and delivering services that are essentially um, community driven. If uh, we, we very much uh, regard it as our role to try and facilitate that data sharing and and use the MBK, uh, the National Bibliographic Knowledge Base, as as uh, as kind of national data infrastructure uh, that will facilitate uh, as much uh, as much. Kind of, uh, use and reuse of data as possible. Uh, there's other statements there about um, being international and, uh, and having nationally agreed standards. 
uh, we uh, we and others uh, are, are trying to, to work work on that as well in terms of uh, trying to push um, suppliers to uh, to look at to, to take a, a more interest in and uh, kind of take a more standardized approach to supplying data at the point of, of, of delivery or indeed as early on in the in the kind of supply chain and data creation process to try and um, you know, put as much quality and and fitness purpose within the data as early on as possible and then we what we want to do is try and uh, make sure that, that data doesn't deprecate as it goes through the supply chain but it, it, it retains the the original quality as as uh, we we've, we've, we've seen and we've we've heard tales of um uh, when data is transformed perhaps from onyx format through into mark format or from uh primary publish publishers to to secondary publishers and aggregators that data gets a bit mangled and some of the quality gets lost and we want to try and retain that so you can see some of those other assertions um i'll move on so we formulated this concept called plan m and it standing for metadata would you believe um to to, to try and uh, kind of articulate the problem space and uh, this is uh, how we try to explain it to uh, the different levels of, of, of audience and, and uh, kind of stakeholders that we're working with in the UK. On the, on the left hand side, we're talking about the kind of more operational uh, levels of you know, cataloging teams and, and, and managers, data managers. On the right hand side, with strategic um, kind of articulation of the problem, we are approaching senior managers and, and library directors and, and, and funders and those with, with an interest in, in working out or or, or or getting assurance that you know this is a problem that 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 uh, we should all care about and uh, that needs to you know have have some focus and attention at all levels. So uh, the the lines kind of scan across in terms of the misdirected effort in looking in the multiple places uh, is uh, in strategic terms uh, translates into a kind of fragmented infrastructure which is uh, inefficient and coherent and therefore um, more costly uh, on a sector wide level. Um, it's, it's been estimated that um, in terms of the uh, Effort staff efforts within the UK on an annual basis. It, there's about um, 15 to 20 million pounds spent on on on, on cataloging within libraries. Um, that's simply on staff time. That's putting to one side um, the acquisition costs of, of some of this data as well. Um, and so you can see down there as well around the duplicated effort uh, and kind of translates into you know, the economic practices. Um, again, on, on, on the strategic side, it's very much focused on, on um, you know, value and uh, uh, investment, cost of investment and savings. Um, on, on the left hand side, it's perhaps more uh, focused on, on, on efficiency. Um, which is two sides, same coin. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so, in terms of um, the plan M and, and kind of what is it and over what timescales we're, we're, we're thinking of trying to, to work through this set of issues, um, we're looking really at, uh, at a kind of five year plan at least um, with, with the effort within the team with, from the JISC side and with our focus. Um, we, we set it out, or, or rather the consultants that we were working with last year um, helped to set this out into, into three main areas. Um, the first one I've called, they called it MBK branding, but um, I've, I've changed that into M, sort of MBK consolidation. That's this idea that we want to um, establish uh, within the UK uh, very firmly in people's minds that this is uh, national data infrastructure. It's, it's for community use. It can be built on and should be built on and should be relied upon to uh, to, as I said, push this push data out or, or to build, build other services on top uh, in terms of perhaps we can use this for interlibrary lending. Uh, we can use it um, more intensively for, for collection management purposes. And we're, we're very motivated to help um, support libraries in, in doing that. Uh, we also, it's been a very intensive time the last few years developing um, some of these services on the MBK. Um, we so uh, we also need to kind of take a breath a little bit and and uh, make sure that the services that we've created are as 
as robust and uh, as, as they as they should be, um, and sort of do a little bit of kind of consolidation of that infrastructure that sits behind the services. The uh, the second area there in terms of strategic partnerships, and I'm going to come on to that. Um, we we uh, are very much aware that that just may um, sit uh, sort of in the middle, as it were, as this kind of uh, broker of activity and this um, uh, this, this kind of agenda setting uh, entity. But we have to work. Uh, uh, we want to work with. Uh, other partners across the system, across the ecosystem, marketplace. Uh, specifically, we've approached um, OCLC, and, uh, and, and we have, have in fact been working with OCLC uh, quite closely for some years now. But we wanted to, um, uh, as, as I'm going to say in a minute, um, um, set out uh, an actual formal agreement with them um, to to help uh, open up data a little more. We uh, also looked into and did a community consultation on working with other suppliers as well. And uh, whilst that isn't happening at the moment, we are certainly, uh, we're very interested in uh, working with data creators and um, and data aggregators uh, in, in any way that we can to uh, continue to open up data. Uh, and also this supply chain engagement piece, which we consider will go on um, through, <clears throat> through 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 the this, this next period of, uh, of years as set out there um, we we think there's a lot of work to do <clears throat> sorry <clears throat> we think there's uh, you know a lot of useful work we can do with with publishers in particular uh, both commercial publishers and open access publishers to you know, try and ensure that the the data that uh, that they push into into this ecosystem uh, is uh, is good at the point of create is is you know, high quality at the point of creation. Uh, there's a lot of um, particularly open access, small open access publishers um, who could benefit from uh, some help, some support, uh, even some tools uh, in order to uh, create a more effective data um, at, at the point of uh, publication. Um, and there's uh, there's uh, we we know that there's a lot of issues with uh, open access data not necessarily appearing um, in in discovery systems um, and issues like Amazon having uh, a no zero price point and therefore it, it uh, um, open access materials are not really appearing in in commercial uh, systems such as that. Um, so. I mentioned that we were uh, in discussions with OCLC, and um, we certainly are moving towards uh, a uh, sort of launching and pushing forwards on a national metadata agreement for the UK uh, with them. It's actually going to be more of a transitional agreement uh, that we're working on for the next um, year. Uh, we've got um, as they've got some negotiation principles up there um, for for you to take a look at. Um, Perhaps, uh, perhaps after this, I'll we'll go through them all right now. But essentially, they're what we're looking for with our um, arrangement uh, with OCLC is is, is more transparency um, around the, the the cost of uh, uh, allowing libraries to access um, the World Cat cataloging, and for that visibility piece within World Cat, uh, we, we push data, as I said, from the MBK through to to World Cat, and it's uh, of uh, great interest to the libraries to have their data visible um, uh, through WorldCat, um, but uh, over over time in the UK and 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 OCLC would uh, have been working on this with us and uh, also are motivated to to try and kind of um, fix this. Um, the, the the pricing has kind of organically kind of been uh, implemented over over some over a decade or more. Uh, and uh, we want we want to seek to, to kind of normalise that pricing, apply just banding to that pricing, so that institutions have a have a clear and and, uh, and kind of fair and equitable way of uh, of um, participating in in WorldCat and getting the benefit from it. Uh, and also, what we've done with the agreement is that uh, we've what we want to put in place. Um, when we formally launch it is the ability for uh, records that um, originate from WorldCat that go into libraries that come into the MBK 
that those full OCLC records will then be available via Library Hub cataloging to the uh, entire MBK community. Uh, up till now, we had to, to, to limit um, or, or exclude uh, OCLC uh, uh, originating records within the MBK. But with this agreement, it means that that opens up uh, that OCLC data for everyone to uh, acquire and uh, to customize and then to reshare. And it gets back to that whole plan in principle and some of those assertions I put up on screen about we need this data to be to flow more freely and to be more open and that the libraries can, can help uh, other libraries to, uh, to make the most of this data. Um, and it's that piece really around uh, community collaboration, which is really at the heart of where we want to position our activities at JISC and, and with the MBK and, and Plan M. Um, we, <clears throat> we, we're very much you know, pushing this idea out to libraries that uh, this they should they should kind of get on board and participate in this national agreement, subscribe to this national agreement um, uh, with a view to uh, perhaps not simply just to get access to the OCLC data, but to help push this um, push this whole piece around uh, more open data. Uh, there was a time some years ago when I first started working on this, and I and others would say this as well. I thought, well, surely, surely we uh, it would be in um, most people's interests to to. Um, uh, and I put uh, a, a CC zero license on on the metadata. It's 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 the you know the metadata is as open as possible, and it's it should make things more discoverable and ultimately for commercial purposes more saleable. Um, it's uh, it, it became apparent fairly quickly that um, the uh, the situation in the UK and that complex. Uh, supply chain with uh, a lot of misaligned incentives um, meant that it was uh, not quite as simple as that. Um, but nonetheless, I think what, we are, what we're doing at the moment is a step towards openness. Um, and I think it catches uh, certainly a, a, a recent recent ish uh, I, I think things ebb and flow don't they but um i think in the last few years metadata is certainly um there's been more emphasis on it there's been more recognition uh of the fact at all levels within the library that um, attention must be paid to it and that quote there is uh, i think it's quite telling from uh one of the focus groups that we ran last year uh we value better quality metadata there was a time we thought it did not matter uh, but high quality metadata gets the reader to what they want. And, um, I think there's a, there's a stronger appreciation of that in the last few years. Uh, this is my final slide. I think I'm, I'm certainly running out of time. Um, so, yeah, this is a busy slide. Sorry about that. It's not hard to, it's not easy to read. Um, but essentially, it's, it kind of sets out um, uh, where we want to get to, or at least is, is representative of where we want to get to um, by focusing more on trying to have this data that is, is more open, more, more reusable, is, is, more, is more shareable or transferable across data infrastructures. I think that's a key point here, and, and I think this is um, uh, uh, one of the reasons that we want to, to work with OCLC and work in partnership uh, with OCLC uh, is to uh, is to work with them and take advantage of, of the of things that they've done uh, in terms of defining next generation metadata. There's a report there from Karen Smith Yoshimura, um, which, uh, which uh, I think it usefully helps to define ways forward. Uh, there's, uh, there's, there's been um, uh, much talk about uh, a, a linked data um, paradigm and, and the, the, there are many places in, in the world that are pushing ahead and, and using that very effectively. I think uh, in the UK we had a, uh, a flurry of, of interest and uh, activity um, back in kind of 2010, 11, 12, 13 maybe. Uh, things went a, a little kind of quiet on that front. Um, I think there's uh, there's an opportunity for the JISC and OCLC and, and, and other the British Library and, and other key stakeholders to, to to really push harder in the direction of uh, for, you know, taking uh, libraries towards uh, linked data environments and and, and 
and really really want to kind of use this momentum that we're building with uh, the MBK and Plan M to uh, push much harder in the direction of authority controls and persistent identifiers. Um, and indeed, uh, in the middle there, I, I've got uh, a kind of uh, another just um, project or, or set of set of projects really uh, based on. Uh, the another service called the Archives Hub. We have the Library Hub, uh, and we also have Archives Hub. Um, and uh, the, that team is is uh, working on a uh, funded project with with other project partners to look into uh, machine learning and, uh, and and bias in collections. And we will definitely want to go in that direction as well with the with the library data that we hold in in, in the aggregation and pick up on on. You know the expertise that they're, they're gaining in that area and, and see how it can be applied across into from the archive space into the library space and lastly on the on the right hand side there um it's you know, I've, I, I i quite like uh, using um some some shots from this is actually from the uh singapore uh, national library board system one search where uh it, it it offers um search results across a whole range of formats and types of materials and uh and this is somewhat something of a holy grail for JISC in terms of our, our services and what we want to get to uh, over the space of that, of that kind of five-year period that i talked about earlier is certainly to be able to have a much more effective way of, of cross-searching uh our, our archival data our library data and our collections data uh, and that's all, uh, as as this community knows very well, um, uh, would be based upon um, more effective uh, ways of de-siloing um, the data and uh, and using those uh, you know authority controls and persistent identifiers in in the best ways that we can. So um, that's a kind of roundup of uh, a quick gallop through of where we are in terms of um, the NBK and, and, and Plan M. And um, uh, yeah, I'll, I think I'll stop there and hand back to Alastair as I uh, look at Thomas's question in the chat. That's great, yes, thank you very much, Neil. Um, certainly it's been really interesting and uh, obviously to be one of the libraries that's participated in the discussions as these uh, initiatives have developed over the last few years, I guess from 2015 onwards when there were the first meetings in London uh, to discuss if these new services were, needing, were needed. Um, so uh, if I could perhaps ask one question before Tom's, um, mm -hmm. with um, one of the things that was uh, noticed and you mentioned uh, is the quality of uh, ebook uh, metadata and that's certainly been something I, I think really over the, the past 18 months with uh, a lot of we are facing uh, multiple national lockdowns and having to uh, continue teaching to students who are often a long way from the university the quality of our metadata especially for our electronic resources became very important um, where do you see the um, discussions going uh, not just in terms of the quality of the metadata, but also for the uh, area of content coverage for things like uh, subscription packages, which are bought in bulk. Ooh, um, yes, I usually speaking, I probably look over to my colleagues in, in licensing for uh, and just licensing for um, uh, some guidance on where uh strategies might go in terms of um you know, going in search of different types of content um i'm just, uh, i mean there is there is much talk uh, in the uk and presumably elsewhere at the moment about just how affordable um uh, you know e-textbooks and ebooks uh, are there's uh i i haven't been following it as closely as some of my colleagues but uh, i know we we, we just go uh, being very energetic uh in terms of um advocacy in that area um but yeah um it's uh, i mean i think from from the point of view of uh you know the content discovery team within JISC and, and, and the mbk um we uh, as i set out in that slide you know we, we'd be very interested in in uh you know working with suppliers um and trying to you know advocate that um that that how that data 
um, uh, retains its its quality from from its uh, from the point of creation. Um, it's early days, I think, in terms of, uh, of reaching out to some of those suppliers. But um, I think we need to also work with libraries to understand um, you know, quite where the, where the problems are and what the problems are. Um, it, it's, it's been kind of often stated that you know, this, this variable quality, but actually when you get down to talking to um, two different groups of libraries, uh, it's actually quite pin, it's hard to pin down um, uh, you know what? What a what a what, certainly what a good quality record is, and, and we've gone away from that language to not talking really about quality of records. We, we talk more about fitness for purpose because um, yes. for, for one group of libraries, um, it's it's it, they they would actually say, well, shelf ready records, yeah, fine, um, they're good enough for us. Uh, you get to the, some of the large libraries, and and they say no, they're very much not good for us. We have vast collections, and our discovery. Uh, requirements are are much more intense than than the teaching university X over there with a fairly small collection. So, um, I think we've also, uh, you know, as um, you know, consumers of the the metadata and indeed uh, customers, uh, when we're buying um, our new resources, it is very often uh, focused more on undergraduates and teaching, not entirely, certainly. Um, but really, what we are um, yeah, even at a, a quite large university like Edinburgh, we are really often looking for something which is fit for purpose, which will pass a known object search, and then we can make sure that's accurately recorded uh, for our online reading lists. It's ready avail readily available for our students. Uh, but certainly um, when we are buying subscription packages, we also need to know that there is actually the fit for purpose metadata is actually there as well when you're often taking in hundreds or even thousands of titles at a time and um, mm -hmm. yes, as you also mentioned that uh, with automation we have been able to free up time to focus more on our special collections backlogs uh, you know across our archives our rare books and such like mm -hmm. so yes it, it's yeah. interesting to consider the two uh, the two sides of it with regards to what we're taking in each year yeah no so a really good point and not something I, I emphasized in, in the talk just now but I've done so before about you know, the, the that efficiency and the savings of time and, and and really what that enables that should enable uh libraries to focus on instead um one of the, the key things here is to is to sort of uh if we can call it you know routine cataloging let's uh, let's just let's just put you know uh, regard that as a uh, as a done deal, as a as a, as a job done. Uh, we, we want to start put routine cataloging. Uh, just just make that happen, and so that uh, libraries can yeah. kind of focus on more interesting um, materials within their collections and, and bring that out and make them make those hidden collections more visible. Uh, Tom, uh, should we move on to your question now? Yeah, I was. Um, thank you for the. Uh, this is a really interesting talk. Um, I was particularly impressed by the frightening slide that you had of the ecosystem um, and the complexity of that ecosystem. Um, uh, I'm struck by the emphasis in Plan uh, M on records and wonder if some sort of graph based approach that would aggregate the contents of records into a common point of reference uh, has been considered. Or is that simply unrealistic given the practicalities of business models in the ecosystem? Yeah, I, th I think you nailed it uh, with the, the second half of, uh, of your question there in terms of um, uh, there's a certain amount of, uh, might, might I say, inertia built into um, how fast and how far we can move um, from this idea of, of, of dealing with records. Uh, there, does, has, there is a lot of talk and has been for a, a, a long time within the UK about how do we get to a kind of postmark environment? Um, how do we, you know, can we, can we stop uh, necessarily focusing on, on records? But uh, I, I think it's, uh, I think we have to factor in the fact that um, the, the need for uh, an inventory uh, of library holdings uh, is not is not going to go away anytime soon. But we need to build on that and and maybe transfer, as I was saying, kind of pull pull data across data infrastructures 
uh, and so that we can think about, okay, well, what does that, that, that kind of postmark environment look like over here? And, and I think, you know, there is a lot of interest, Thomas, in, 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 in you know, in the graph-based approach and those, those common points of reference and, and uh, thinking carefully about what, uh, how to implement um, you know, these authorities and um, working with uh, another reason for you know, working with uh, OCLC and others is uh, to push harder in the direction of VF and, um, and you know, kind of links through to, to those, those common points of reference. Uh, I think I think everybody realizes it's it's the way to go. It's just a question of uh, kind of you know kind of revving up the giant juggernaut and, and trying to sort of or, or whatever analogy you want to use a, a large train, a big truck, a, a, a super tanker. It's trying to you know it's it's trying to turn uh, turn uh, this 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 kind of uh, large uh, enterprise uh, around slowly. I think is probably the way to put it. Well, the way I see it, anyway. Alistair, you may have other <laughs> other thoughts on on how, how um, we get there. I, I'm sort of coming back to the idea of the known object search and the unknown object search. Um, I think perhaps with our current suite of um, library management and discovery tools, um, what I think we might be looking to do more is to extract. Uh, certain sets of our metadata from there and actually publish them elsewhere uh, in a, in a graph-based model. Um, and I suppose it does depend with things that you're acquiring now, will some of this material uh, be of interest in decades to come or not? Because uh, we do acquire an awful lot of things, both print and electronic. So, I'm sort of going with identifying where you would want to move the model forward and where you do just actually need a straightforward fit for purpose, um, you know, uh, inventory and description of what you hold and what's relevant to the uh, teaching uh, and in some cases research activities at the time. Yeah, I mean, uh, Anton's put a question in there as well, and um, it's sort of asking you know if there's more precise allusions being used to um, shared vocabularies. Um, uh, I think yeah, picking up on what you just said there, Alistair, I, I, it seems to me that that, that what uh, JISC and OCLC and and a coalition of the willing amongst libraries and those who who, who want to kind of um, push forward on this, you know, we could do some. Some pilot work in terms of uh, uh, taking kind of sets of of data out, as Alice just says, and and really kind of working through what the benefit is, particularly for for research and novel research. If we uh, if we if we if we can join these, um, you know, if we can use shared vocabularies and uh, and you know new ways of knowledge organisation, as you've put there, Antoine, then. I think you know what we need to prove there is is that it drives novel research, um, and that's that's the, that, that's the key thing that's going to capture the imagination of those who can fund um, more of this activity and, and help us push harder in the direction of uh, of the sorts of, of what you've put out there. Um, I think we should also also be very careful not to think uh, new. It doesn't matter old it's been there a long time and it's important so um, there are many things published uh, or created today which are going to have a very long um, life of significance for, uh, for both teaching and research mm -hmm. yeah yeah no I'm, I'm very much looking forward to kind of um yeah as i say kind of getting uh, national agreements in place getting kind of uh you know Good conversations going with all these stakeholders across the ecosystem, and then kind of going right now. We've got our eyes on the prize for um, pushing forwards with the into more a more visionary space um, based on more open, more reusable, and more more linked linked data in all of its forms and terminologies. Okay. Um... Do we have any other questions for? Oh yes, uh, Antoine, you have another question. 
<clears throat> yes, yes, thanks. Uh, yeah, and thanks a lot, Neil, for the uh, the great presentation. It was yeah, very uh, very impressive indeed. And yeah, we yeah, I, I mean, as, as European, we can recognize a lot of the challenges, uh, and <laughs> we do appreciate probably a very ambitious. Uh, visions like these ones, which are very much needed for the domain. Uh, when you say that high quality metadata is a serious thing to tackle, uh, then we can only endorse this because we also benefit from, from the existence of such, such a, a vision and ecosystem. Uh, we do know that there are some challenges though. Uh, and one of them is the deduplication. Uh, and it is it is key, and I, I was wondering whether you have some some experience to share uh, on how well it can work uh, in that ecosystem uh, as the well one of the bases to 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 deliver all the services that that you have mentioned. Mm, sure. Yeah. I mean, deduplication is very much at the heart of uh, certainly our Discover system, uh, and indeed the the, the compare uh, service as well. And um, I mean, we've benefited um, with the Library Hub services in as far as we've based experience on, on, on a previous service called COPAC that, that was uh, the predecessor to the Library Hub. And we've had staff who've been working on deduplication issues for 20 years. Um, and, and so, uh, I, I mean, as far as from, from my perspective being uh, uh, non-technical and, and kind of uh, strategic uh, it's kind of black magic uh, in terms of the, the all, all of the ways that that one can can or could apply uh, deduplication it's it's uh, I, I know I know that from talking to staff uh, on the topic that you can go to you know uh, any depth you, you you choose to really in terms of uh, trying to focus on a particular area of say you know 19th century political pamphlets and and what, what sort of algorithms do you put in to precisely kind of identify how to deduplicate de those by title which can be very variable obviously and so you end up with with a with, with a great kind of raft great sea of of, of of different measures that one can put in place depending on the kind of you know the the aggregation that you're talking about and so there has to be a balance really you have to find uh you have to also what we sought to do yeah, and what we want to do more of is to get input from from libraries and and try and make our deduplication process despite the fact that they're very complicated um make our approach as transparent as possible um and to say okay well uh, th these are the steps we're taking at the moment uh, uh, not perhaps not what every single detail step but the, you know the approach and and how's that working for you uh, is is what you're seeing um, making making sense at the at the user end, um, and yeah, it's uh, it, it, it's something that's that, that we've we've tackled just uh, over years and years of, of trying to do it. Um, but um, I think there's yeah, it, it's just one of those facets of running such a complex system that uh, one can always kind of move the dials slightly. Um, but I think I think that, that that user input is key just to check um, whether the the way that we're approaching it and the way that we are delivering it is is making sense. And um, certainly, one thing that uh, that I do hear from colleagues in special collections is that the availability of um, a, a non undeduplicated uh, database is useful. Certainly, if you're wanting to compare different copies of published objects, the copy specific notes pertaining to different institutions is very interesting. Uh, yeah, and, yeah. and also the, the ability if you are um, perhaps uh, dealing with special collections backlogs, the ability to focus your searches on particular institutions that you know perhaps have collection strengths or indeed excel at producing um, you know, good quality um, metadata in that particular specialist area. So mm. I think there's, there's certainly, there is a role for uh, the deduplicated database, but also for the unduplicated one as well. 
Yeah, uh, that, that's very much the, the 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 conclusion we came to after a few years of working with OCLC. Um, that, I mean, OCLC um, take a different approach in that they they consolidate their their records. Um, they're not calling them master records anymore. I believe they've 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 um, looking at their the language that they're using there in terms of um, uh, through 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 a lens of um, you know cultural references. Um, but uh, we took a decision uh, uh, a year or so ago to um, go back to an undeduplicated database for our cataloging system uh, for precisely the reasons you talked about, Alistair. Uh, and I, I, I would hope that um, uh, you know, by having the choice of either taking a consolidated um, WorldCat record or going to uh, Library of Cataloging, taking a specific um record from a specific source i think that usefully gives uh, hopefully gives libraries a uh, good choice in terms of uh where they want to uh, what sort of record that they they want to acquire there's anything to come back to tom's point if uh, if for example uh you were looking at an, an historical collection which has been scattered to different um, parts of the country or indeed across different countries when that's the case really where the graph based model would come into its own that you could track um, which institution or person perhaps owned different objects uh, and uh, you could locate them uh, you know potentially um, rebuild what that collection was um, we, we have certainly several uh, collections where we know that other parts of the historic collection are located in different institutions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, 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 that's the, yeah, the, precisely the kind of um, uh, research that, that we'd be very interested in, in, in supporting and pursuing. Um, and uh, we're also looking at kind of triple IF in terms of you know, bringing images back together again from different collections as well. And uh, the archives hub team are, as, a, as I mentioned, uh, uh, looking into that the, those kinds of you know, how you pull data together, either either pictorial data or or indeed um, text data. Okay, uh, so, do we have any final questions for any of our um, panelists this morning? Okay, well, um, I think in that case, uh, we'll bring the session to a close. So I'd like to thank uh, Neil and Monica Antoine, uh, two uh, very different perspectives on large scale um, metadata and image aggregation. Uh, so thank you everyone uh, for attending and uh, have uh, in, uh, enjoy the rest of your day or evening, uh, wherever you are. Thank Thanks you, everyone. Thanks, Alistair. Thank you. And thanks, Alistair, for the great moderation. Okay.